let's get started. Um, you, you've spent your childhood with Texas. Uh, you have also spent some of your summers with working on your ranch uh, with your grandfather. I've heard you personally talk about your experiences very fondly. Uh, how have those summers played in the industry? Well, I got very lucky because um, my grandfather was almost a third parent for me. And uh, I spent all my summers on my grandfather's ranch from about age four to 16. And uh, in the beginning, he, he could create the illusion for me when I was four years old that I was actually golfing. Um, but later, I actually was golfing. I learned so much from my grandfather because he was, I think this is true of many people in rural areas, they're very self-reliant, they're very resourceful. They can get things done on their own. They don't just pick up the phone and call for help. And uh, so he, you know, we built our own barns and he had a caterpillar bulldozer that we would repair all the time and fixing our own vehicles. He would even make his own, he did all of his own veterinary work. He would suture up the animals and he would, um, he would make his own needles. I was always amazed by this. He would take a piece of wire and heat it with a blowtorch and pound it until it's thin and drill a little hole in the end and sharpen it and make his own needles and do his own veterinary work. Some of the animals even survived. It was incredible. Uh, so yeah, it, but, but that kind of self-reliance that you uh, see from people in rural areas was really, it made a big impression on me. I know you have been asked this question many times, but I still think the audience would love to hear from you. How do you make the decision to take a chance to start Amazon.com? I mean, you were well settled, you had a great job. Uh, while it seems very obvious today, this must have been a difficult decision. Yeah, it was. I was living and working in New York City in 1994. I came across the fact that the World Wide Web was growing very quickly. It was tiny, but it was growing very fast. Most people had not heard of it. And uh, I came up with this idea. The idea initially was very simple, it was to sell books online. And I went to my boss, who I liked a lot, his name was David, and I said, I have this idea to start this company to sell books on the internet. And he took me on a long walk in Central Park in New York, and listened to this idea in great detail, and he said, it actually sounds like a really good idea to me, but I think it would be a better idea for somebody who didn't already have a good job. And uh, I thought about that. That made a certain amount of sense to me. And he said, why don't you think about it for two days before you make a final decision? And so I went away and I thought about this. And I was trying to figure out how to make this decision, because in the moment, personal life decisions, those choices could be very challenging. And I finally figured out, for me, the right way to think about it, which was, I wanted not to have regrets. I pictured myself, you know, 80 years old, and thinking back on my life in a quiet moment of reflection, would I regret leaving this company in the middle of the year and walking away from my annual bonus and all those things that in the moment could be very confusing? And I thought, you know, when I'm 80, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not even going to remember it. But what I will do, I know for a fact, I have this idea, and if I don't try, I'm going to regret having never tried. And I know also, if I try and fail, I'll never regret having tried and failed. And as soon as I thought about it that way, I knew I had to give it a try. And, and did you ever think that I was going And did you ever think that Amazon could have been the success that you have been? No. So the, you know, what's actually happened over the last 25 years is way beyond my expectations. Just remember, I was delivering the packages myself 25 years ago. We were selling books. I was hoping to build a company, but not a company like what you see today. Everything was one step at a time. Uh, I mean, I'm curious, what uh, would you have done if this bread didn't pay up? I would be an extremely happy software programmer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it feels good to me because I am a software engineer by profession, so I think I'm in the right place. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's fascinating to see, you know, personally, I, I've been very impressed uh, by how you have been able to scale as a leader, as a builder, uh, as an operator, starting as a founder of a small online bookstore, but now being able to serve hundreds of millions of customers globally across many, many lines of businesses. And, and today in our audience, we have many uh, entrepreneurs, small businesses who have big dreams. Yeah. And I was wondering that if you have any advice to them as they scale their own businesses. Well, you know, yes, I've seen Amazon at every scale level. So I've seen it when it was one person, it was just me. I've seen it when it was 10 people, and 100 people, and 1,000 people. Today around the world, it's more than 700,000 people. And at each stage, I've had to lead the company differently. Um, you know, in the very beginning, not only are you deciding what to do, but you're also deciding how to do it. And in fact, in the very beginning, you're even just doing it yourself. So that's the beginning. And then as the company got a little bigger, it begins to be about 100 people, and you're still helping figure out not only what to do, you're still figuring out how to do it, um, but you're doing less and less yourself. You're, other people are doing the things, and you're helping them figure out how to do it. And then as the company gets even bigger, eventually that question changes, and you stop helping as much with the how, and you get more exclusively help with, with the what. So you start figuring out what to do, but not how to do it. And then, when the company gets even bigger than that, the question switches again, and you stop spending as much time even figuring out how, what to do, but you start figuring out the who. So the question sort of progresses, you're choosing leaders, and so the big question becomes the who question. And so you kind of go from the question of how, to the question of what, to the question of who. And that's been my progression. And I'll tell you, the who, is, has been so valuable for me because I have always been figuring out how to hire people who could be my tutor, people who would teach me. And that is, if you ever get lucky enough to be hiring people, make sure you're hiring people not only that you can teach, you can teach them what you know, but make sure you're hiring people who also are going to teach you things and that they can be your tutors. And that has been the secret to the scaling of Amazon all along the way. Thank you. Um, um, let's talk about failures. I know Amazon has had a share of failures. In fact, I remember having been part of something uh, at Amazon. Um, I'm curious to know how do you think about failure? Uh, how should we need to figure in this? Well, Amazon is the best place in the world to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is we have a lot of practice. <laughs> and uh, in, in, by the way, there are multiple kinds of failure. There are at least two kinds that are really important. There are experiments. You're trying to figure out something new, maybe that nobody in the world has ever done before. That is high quality failure. Because when you're experimenting, you don't know if it's gonna work. In fact, if you know in advance that something is going to work, then it is not an experiment. And so you want to be doing as many experiments per unit time, as many experiments per day, per week, per month, per year as you can, because that's how you get invention. That's what you, how you get innovation. Innovation is all about maximizing the rate of experimentation. And so you have to organize to be able to experiment. You have to have a culture that supports failure. Amit and I, together, we've been working together for two decades. Amit and I have failed together so many times. And that is, uh, that is it's another way of learning. There's a second kind of failure which you should try to avoid. That's operational excellence failure. When you do know how to do something, you have to treat that differently. When we go to open a new fulfillment center, for example, we know how to do that. If we fail at that, that's just 
bad execution. And that, again, by the way, that happens also. We feel that way too. But that's, you should never celebrate that kind of failure. <laughs> when, when that happens, you need to say, okay, let's look in the mirror, let's be self-critical, let's figure out what did we do wrong, and you learn from that also, but you have to acknowledge that that's the bad kind of failure. So when we're talking about that first type of failure, we're really talking about inventing, experimenting, eagerness to invent has to be accompanied hand in hand with a willingness to fail. Nobody likes to fail. By the way, failure, even when you know it's important and good, it's embarrassing, um, it doesn't feel good, we're all human, we had a good idea, we thought it was a good idea, and nobody came to the party. That happens. And here's the great thing though, one success, one winner, can pay for dozens and dozens of failures. And that is why you should fail. Um, I myself have some scar tissue having worked on auction with an Z shop. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, I remember. I have the same scar tissue all over my body. It's, so pretty much uh, all proof that I ever wrote gold that Amazon has vanished. <laughs> But, but the exciting thing is, a lot of those inventions actually helped us launch India. That's right. Which is a... Yeah, yeah. because, you know, auctions was a failure, Z Shops was a failure, and then, but out of those ashes came Marketplace. And then Marketplace has, was a huge success, and it formed the whole foundation for Amazon India. <laughs> so, this can change years again. Um, I'm curious if you could share how did you get involved in space? There is e-commerce and now space. And uh, maybe if you could share a little bit about what you are up to and why that's important. Well, um, I have a company called Blue Origin. It's building reusable space vehicles. It is uh, a childhood passion of mine, first of all. I started um, getting interested in space when I was a five-year-old boy. And I watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the surface of the moon. And I have been studying rockets and rocketry and rocket propulsion and space travel since I was a little boy. In high school, I read a book called The High Frontier by Jerry O'Neill and uh, started thinking about the idea of humanity expanding out into the solar system. I believe this is extremely important. We have a choice as a civilization. We can either have a life, I'm talking about you know, many decades from now or the next couple of hundred years. We have a choice. We can have a life of stasis and because Earth is finite and we are running into the limits of that right now when you look at things like climate change. Earth is a finite planet. And if we continue to grow, and we continue to use more energy per capita, all of those things have brought us uh, uh, an expanding civilization and uh, all kinds of wonderful uh, uh, things that we value, world-class medicine and vaccines and all these things as we've expanded. But we also use a lot of energy to produce those things. I think over the long run, again, I'm talking kind of hundreds of years, our descendants are going to move all heavy industry off of Earth. All the polluting industry will be done in space where we have infinite resources for all practical matters. And Earth can effectively be zoned light industry and residential. And Earth can be this amazing garden. We have sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system. We humans have done that. This is the good one. There are no other good planets in this solar system. We have to take care of this one. And we have to do that a bunch of different ways. There's a lot of here and now things we need to do to take care of this planet. But long term, if we want to continue to grow our civilization, and, and have the freedom to do that. We need to also use the resources of the solar system. And to do that, we need a 
dynamic, entrepreneurial civilization in space. We need there to be space entrepreneurs. I have had the great fortune, alongside Ahmed over the last 20 years, to watch on the internet the most dynamic, entrepreneurial, it's been so exciting. And what could happen on the internet is that two kids in a dorm room could build a company the scale of Facebook. Two kids in a dorm room could build a company that today has a half a trillion dollar market cap. That kind of dynamism cannot exist in space today. Two kids in a dorm room can't build anything interesting in space. The cost of admission, the price of admission is just too high. To do really interesting things in space, the price tag starts in the hundreds of millions of dollars and goes up from there. And that's the job of Blue Origin as I see it. I want Blue Origin to reduce the cost of access to space by such a large magnitude that we can have two kids in a dorm room start a great space company. That will be the future generations. We'll be able to do that. And we will all benefit from that. It's very exciting. We need reusable rockets to do that. So that's our focus. But talking about also taking care of this planet, um, I know you're an optimist, but the threats of climate change are very real and yeah. worrying. Yeah. I'm curious to know how do you visualize the future in, in, uh, in given those threats? Well, this is something um, that's going to take collective action all over the world. These problems, you know, you can go back 10 years and 20 years, and there were people who just did not acknowledge that climate change is real. Anybody today who is not acknowledging that climate change is real, that we humans are affecting this planet in a very uh, significant and dangerous way, those people are not being reasonable. This is a big problem, and it's going to take collective action all over the world if we are going to make progress on that problem. I'm very proud of what Amazon is doing. Uh, we just announced the Climate Pledge. The Climate Pledge is to reach the goals of the Paris Accord 10 years early. Amazon is going to be 100% sustainable electricity by 2030 as a step on the way to that climate pledge. We've announced the acquisition of 100,000 electric delivery vehicles. Uh, we've announced here in <coughs> India that we're going to eliminate all plastic by coming right up June, June 2020, just six months from now. And one of the things that large companies like Amazon can do, if Amazon were a 500 person company, you know, uh, we could announce the Climate Pledge, it would be a very nice thing to do, and, uh, and I encourage uh, small companies to do what they can for climate change, but when a large company like Amazon with 700,000 employees and a big global footprint, when we do something like the Climate Pledge, it really can be a needle mover, because it's not just Amazon, it's our supply chain. All of the partners and companies and delivery companies that we work with, for us to meet that pledge, they have to meet that pledge. And so it has a multiplier effect when a big company like Amazon gets very serious about meeting the goals of the Paris Accord 10 years earlier, we can have a big impact. And we're also working, I'm using my own connections, working with other CEOs around the world to get them to do similar things. So I'm very excited about it. It's a place where it's gonna take big companies small companies, individuals doing the right thing, it's going to take nation states doing the right thing. This isn't something that can be done by any company, even a large company, but it is something that we can achieve with collective action. And as always as as said, I am an optimist. I do think we will do that. We only have one planet. We all share it. There's only one atmosphere. We all share it. There's only one set of oceans. We all share them. This is uh, this is, a, is something that requires joint action. People will come together around a goal like this. It is going to happen. So 
Jeff, you're in the midst of uh, thousands of SMBs in this room. And uh, as I was just talking about, I feel the Indian SMB is very unique in their resourcefulness and inventiveness. In fact, I get emails from some of you, uh, you know, I get emails every day where they talk about how they're embracing technology and not just making a difference in, in their own business, but very meaningful impact to the people around them. I believe uh, you know you have fondly referenced yourself as an SMB in the past, and just something exciting to share. So we'd love to hear from you. I do. I have an exciting announcement to make, and as I said, I was an SMB. I started. It's hard to remember, but 25 years ago, Amazon was a tiny little company, and uh, you know, not only was I driving the packages to the post office myself, but I was wrapping them. Um, and, and preparing them and, you know, doing all the things that small entrepreneurs do. Today, we're announcing that we're going to invest an incremental one billion U.S. dollars in digitizing small and medium businesses. And... Part of that is that we are going to use, again, try to use Amazon's size, scope, and scale. We're going to use our global footprint to export outside of India, to export 10 billion US dollars of Make in India goods. From that by the year 2025. So we're super excited about this. We have plans to do it. All the thanks and hard work goes to Ahmed and his team. Thank you for all of you folks in this room. Yes, in this room, we are being successful. Just to give you some context, you know, we are already seeing, as I said, over a million artisans and viewers and women entrepreneurs in our marketplace to get 10 million more of them digitized by 2025 and to increase exports with an equivalent of billion dollars in investment jet. It's very, very exciting, both for our customers and millions of small union businesses and local shops in the country. I'm curious uh, why you know, this that Part of us, the, the goal there, don't forget, is to make sure that more people can participate in the prosperity of India. And I believe you got a chance to interact with one of them just outside before you walked in. I did. I, in fact, I visited this the uh, jacket that I'm wearing uh, was given to me by one of the SMBs that I visited outside, so I'm wearing it very proudly. <laughs> so it was very exciting to use, and I'm curious, is, is there a reason why you're making this announcement now? Well, we're making this announcement now because it's working. Um, we've been doing this, and it is working, and uh, when something works, you should double down on it. And that's what we're doing. And that's why we're doing it now. And, you know, Jeff, uh, any final words before we sign off? Yeah, I do, I do have some final words. Um, I want to make a prediction for you. I predict that the 21st century is going to be the Indian century. dynamism, the energy. Everywhere I go here, I meet people who are interested in self-improvement and growth. This country has something special, and it's a democracy. This is going to be the Indian century, and I'll make one more prediction for you. In this 21st century, the most important alliance is going to be the alliance between India and the United States. The world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy.
Thank you, Jeff. That's very motivating and inspiring as always. Thank you for joining us today.